he said, now I'm going to kill you. Now you're going to die. I've been prosecuting murderers for 15 years. I wanted the earth to open and swallow me. And I've never lost a homicide case. He is a psychopath and, and a, a sexual sadist. My job is to fight for justice. He maintained that he was set up. I've been defending the accused for over 20 years. It was virtually impossible that Mr. Avery could have committed that assault. Ensuring the innocent don't serve time for someone else's crime. Not guilty, Your Honor. For true justice to be served, we need to answer one single question. On the western shore of Lake Michigan is a unique slice of paradise. A six mile stretch of beach that offers residents of Manitowoc, Wisconsin, a perfect place to escape the rigors of daily life. And one day in late July, 1985, Penny and Tom Bernston were looking to do just that. It was a beautiful day. And when we were done working for the day, my husband and I went to the beach. Leaving her husband behind, Penny, a 36-year-old working mother of two, sets off on a long run. Penny ran a lot in those years. Uh, she was uh, very much into fitness and uh, was a pretty strong runner. After I would say half to three quarters of a mile, there was a guy probably 10 yards away from me. He had a leather jacket slung over his shoulder. As I jogged by, he hollered to me. Great day for a jog. Yeah, beautiful day. Didn't really think anything of it and continued jogging. After about a half hour, I turned around and was heading back. About a mile from where her husband is waiting for her, Penny sees the stranger again. He started running towards me. I thought he's gonna grab me. So I increased my speed to try and get away from him. But he caught up to me at the water's edge. He grabbed me and I screamed for help. But there were no people around and he tightened his grip over my neck. I couldn't scream anymore. He said, we're gonna take a little walk up into the sand dunes. I'm scared out of my wits. The man drags Penny into a secluded spot among the trees. Two thoughts went through my mind. I need to stay calm. I need to get a good look at this guy. Because if I survive this, I want to be able to give a good description. He um, opened his pants and started asking me to do sexual things. The next time he loosened his grip, I kicked him in the groin. He said, now I'm going to kill you. Now you're going to die. Penny would typically run for 45 minutes, but once it got well past an hour, uh, I became concerned. I made a call uh, to the police department. When I came to, I tried to stand up, um, and I immediately fell over.
there was a young couple on the beach and I hollered to them for help. We saw a couple coming towards us uh, carrying Penny. She was obviously in shock. Very frightening uh, because we didn't know how bad the injuries were. This is a terrifying crime. Penny Berenson is lucky to be alive. It's awful, but reality is that every two minutes, another person in the US is sexually assaulted. This is the type of case where police and prosecutors are under extreme pressure from the community to solve it fast. And that means the sooner they can get a description from Penny, the better. But there's a problem with that. Penny is so badly beaten, three hours pass before a deputy can speak with her. I said that he had kind of um, dirty blonde hair, a scruffy beard and a mustache. And that he's between five feet six and five feet eight inches tall. That sounds like the description of local troublemaker Stephen Avery a man currently out on bail for attacking the wife of a sheriff's deputy. Avery is a one-man crime wave. He's been convicted of burglary twice, and then he attacked the deputy's wife. The list of locals who could have committed this crime is short, and Stephen Avery's name is on it in bold. Avery's a likely suspect, all right, and Penny's description sounds a lot like him but a victim's description of a stranger is something to be very careful with, and that goes double for a traumatized victim. To help confirm their hunch, the sheriff sends a sketch artist to Penny's bedside. He had a wide-ish nose. By the time he was finished, wavy hair, I felt the sketch was a fairly accurate representation of my assailant. Does he look like this? I guess so. The sheriff also came to the hospital. He put nine photos on my bedside table and asked me to look carefully at each photo to determine whether or not my assailant might be among them. I remember looking carefully at the photos and um, eventually picking one. It's Stephen Avery. After the identification was made, the police went to Mr. Avery's house. His wife, asked Stephen what was going on, and Stephen replied to her that they said that I assaulted a woman. But the police deny telling him that. If he wasn't there, where'd he get the information? Where else would he get it? Stephen Avery is a bad egg, that's for sure. But that's not the question. Is Avery the guy who assaulted Penny? That's the question. And the first thing you have to ask is, was he somewhere else when Penny was attacked? Stephen Avery spent the afternoon at his parents' salvage yard with his wife and children. He was out in the yard pouring concrete. He had 13 or 14 witnesses. Avery and his family left the salvage yard around 4.30. Where'd you go from there? To go to Green Bay which is about 40 miles north of Manitowoc. He had a receipt from the Shopco store in Green Bay that puts the Averys at a checkout line at a specific time. An alibi is just like any other piece of evidence. You have to scrutinize it. And when you do, this one has some problems. For starters, nearly everyone vouching for Avery is a family member. For me, that's a big red flag, especially when you realize that just about all of them have had their own scrapes with the law. For the sheriff's office, Penny's ID is enough to revoke Avery's bail and put him back behind bars. And that's where he is two days after the assault, 
when Penny receives a chilling phone call. Hello? Who is this? Two days after being brutally attacked, Penny Burnson is home recovering. While the man police believe is responsible, Stephen Avery, sits behind bars. Though it may not help heal her physical wounds, believing the perpetrator has been caught helps Penny rest a little easier. That is, until her phone rings. Hello? That's an obscene phone call. Who is this? He's talking about sexual things that he wants to do to me. Referencing the assault on the beach. This man has my phone number, so he knows where I live. And I have two small children, and I'm panicked. This phone call is a big problem for the case against Stephen Avery. The caller is the guy who assaulted Penny. Trouble is, Avery is in jail. No phone. So whoever really did it is still out there. Not so fast. Stephen Avery knows he's got a bad reputation and he needs to make people believe he couldn't possibly be Penny's attacker. It is the easiest thing in the world to set up a call from the outside and tell the guy what to say. Penny calls the sheriff. He decides the best way to reassure her they have the right man is to set up a live lineup. That way, Penny can identify the monster who nearly killed her. The men were behind a, a one-way glass. And I was in the room next door. The strongest part of this case is Penny's eyewitness account. The assault occurred in broad daylight. She got a good look at her attacker. If she does pick out Stephen Avery, that's something you can take to a jury as compelling proof. He is the right guy. I look carefully at each one. And when I came to number six, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I felt the color drain from my face. My hands got sweaty. I felt like I was gonna pass out or faint. Um, I just had this real gut reaction. It was Stephen Avery. Penny nails him. Avery is charged with first degree sexual assault and attempted murder. And just like that, the obscene phone calls stop. The crime against Penny was awful. Somebody deserves to be punished. But is it really Avery? The prosecution has built its whole case around Penny IDing Avery. There's no other witness and no physical evidence. In my experience, there's nothing less reliable than a traumatized victim picking some guy out of a lineup. Remember, Avery's got an alibi. Four and a half months after Penny's terrible ordeal on the beach, Stephen Avery's trial gets underway. Leading up to the trial, I'm, I'm pretty much a mess. You know, I'm seeing a therapist. I was feeling low and feeling sorry for myself. Finally, it's Penny's chance to get even. All she needs to do is identify the man who attacked her. I was very nervous. I remember looking at him, almost feeling like this is a battle and I'm gonna look you in the eye and I want you to understand what you did to me. Could you point him out to us, please? Penny's only goal is to convict the man who attacked her. He was a stranger. She has no motive to tell anything but the truth. A jury's biggest job is almost always deciding whom to believe. In this case, it has to be the victim. I thought she was absolutely honest when she identified Stephen Avery. She was an outstanding witness. With Avery's ID secured in front of the jury, the prosecution moves on to demolish his alibi. 
you have him working at his father's house and a whole bunch of witnesses saying that he was there helping pour cement. Around what time when you left for Green Bay? 3.30. Avery's family swear he was at the yard all afternoon. They could be lying. But even if they aren't, would they have noticed if he'd slipped away for a while? A lady at the checkout counter at a store in Green Bay remembered he and his wife and his children going through the line. And of course, there was a cash register receipt with the time on it. Penny was pretty positive about the time of the offense. And when you put the two together, there's there enough time for him to be in that store and also to commit that offense. The Sheriff's Department showed the only way to make that work was for them to speed at 80 miles per hour. You gave the defendant about an hour to commit the crime. Avery's alibi doesn't look so solid anymore. So his lawyer attacks the ID process, calling it a sham that led the victim to only one possible conclusion, Stephen Avery. It didn't strike me as anybody pointing a finger at uh, Stephen Avery. It seems to me the whole process obviously is done with the idea that the victim will be able to pick out the suspect from the pictures they're looking at. With the eyewitness identification and the indications from the defendant that uh, he had knowledge of the crime, uh, that's probably more than enough to support guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. After a four-day trial, the jury returns its verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Stephen Avery, guilty of the count of first-degree sexual assault and attempted murder. Avery is convicted of first-degree sexual assault and attempted murder, sending him to prison for 32 years. I was ecstatic, and then I remember just feeling completely exhausted. And I finally wept for what happened to me. I just broke down. There was a lot of anger that started coming out. What convicted Avery was Penny's pointing finger. There was little else. Stephen Avery was found guilty, but I don't buy it that he was proven guilty. Penny's life slowly returns to normal until about a month later when her phone rings. Hello. Who is this? The obscene phone calls resumed and I would generally get them shortly after I returned home from work. What do you want? I would go into the house and within a few minutes, I would get an obscene phone call. I remember saying to the sheriff, it's almost like someone's watching the house. The caller reveals details of the assault only her attacker would know. It can't be Stephen Avery. So, who is it? It's January 1986, and the new year rings in a renewed sense of peace for Penny Burnson. Stephen Avery, the man convicted of sexually assaulting her, has been locked up for the next 32 years. But when she tells the police about new obscene phone calls... Hello? Leave me alone! Their response shatters her world once more. The police department said, we have another suspect in mind who looks like Stephen Avery. They asked me whether I noticed anybody kind of stalking me. Have you ever noticed a car parked either outside your house or somewhere on the block where you live? I was very alarmed, thinking, oh my gosh, maybe the wrong guy is in custody. And the guy that assaulted me is still out there. The Manitowoc Police Department, Detective Tom Bergner specifically, believed very strongly that the Sheriff's Department had the wrong person. I went to the Sheriff and I just said, 
you know, we got this guy similar to their suspect. And the sheriff told me that the victim pretty much identified the suspect. So it wasn't that they were looking for somebody. Detective Bergner's concerns are dismissed by the sheriff. And the other suspect is forgotten. I called the sheriff's department to check on whether or not they had, in fact, looked into this other suspect. And I was told, yes, we looked into it. He checked out. He's got an alibi. I've been in this business a long time. And there's one thing that should happen, but rarely does. The government figuring out it might have convicted the wrong guy and then doing something to fix their mistake. Sometimes my learned colleagues on the defense side see more evil in the criminal justice system than they do in their own clients. It's their job. I get it. But Steve and Avery's jury had no reasonable doubt he was guilty. Refusing to admit guilt, Stephen Avery urges his legal team to appeal his conviction. Their strongest card remains his alibi. You know, from when they say this happened and where I was, I can't be in two places at one time. The attack ended at five after four. Stephen Avery would have had to have walked back to the parking lot, which was about a half mile away, gotten into his truck, driven the 10 miles back to the salvage yard to pick up his wife and his five children, and then drive the 40 miles up to Green Bay to get to the checkout line at the store at 5.15 p.m. The sheriff's department didn't take into account that he had to pick up five children and the time it would take to get young infants into car seats. Other than Penny's ID, the case against Avery is entirely circumstantial. The prosecution wove together what they knew about Avery, that he was a bad guy, with what they knew about his whereabouts. And now, under the closer scrutiny of an appeal, the sketch made from Penny's description of her attacker turns out to be unreliable. I was told that the sketch artist said, before I did the sketch, I was handed a photo of Stephen Avery and told, make the sketch look like this. A deputy at the Sheriff's Department said that the composite sketch was basically drawn off the mugshot, almost as if somebody was looking at the mugshot and then drew the composite sketch. Once Penny believed that that's what the assailant looked like, it was a foregone conclusion that she picked Mr. Avery. Now we've got a big problem. Under the law, this is called an impermissibly suggestive identification process. In plain English, we say leading the witness. And if what you're after is the truth, it's not how you get there. Unfortunately for Stephen Avery, there are no witnesses prepared to testify in court that the evidence was rigged. It remains hearsay. It's not just the sketch that's a problem. I said that my assailant had brown eyes, but Stephen Avery has blue eyes. Stephen Avery, he was a mechanic and he had perpetually had greasy hands. It, Penny was asked several times by the police, thinking that it was Mr. Avery, did your assailant have greasy hands? Penny was really clear that her assailant's hands were clean. Penny also has doubts about the lineup. Stephen Avery was the only person who was in both the photo array and the live lineup. I remember when I looked at the live lineup feeling like, I don't know why some of these guys are even in there. They don't match the description that I gave of my assailant. The defense lawyer at the time complained vigorously about how the live lineup was done. They also pointed out that it did take Penny 10 minutes to pick out Mr. Avery. The Justice Department reviewed it and determined the police secured a fair and balanced identification. Penny's ID of Stephen Avery is what sent him to prison. Prison is where he belongs. Avery's appeal 
is denied, as are all subsequent appeals. 17 years go by, during which Stephen Avery continues to protest his innocence. Flash forward to 2002, and DNA analysis has taken a dramatic leap. Judge Hazelwood is petitioned by Avery's defenders to take another look at his case. They ordered a second round of DNA tests in this case. The science had progressed to the point where they could test some hairs that they couldn't test before. When the test results return, they're incendiary. In September of 2003, the crime lab in Madison, Wisconsin called our office and informed us that some key evidence in, the, in Penny Burnson's assault, a hair actually, after it was tested, the DNA result came back to a known sex offender by the name of Gregory Allen. They called him the Sandman because one of his earlier crimes, two years prior to Penny being assaulted, he lunged at a young woman on the same stretch of the beach. Mr. Helen had a record for prowling. He would be on private property looking in windows. One of the most serious complaints was where a young girl was home alone. and she was assaulted. Shockingly, on the day of Penny's assault, Allen was being tailed by Manitowoc police. But that afternoon, they lost him. The officers were tied up on other calls of service and never had a chance to check on Mr. Allen's position. Allen was left free to prowl the beach and attack Penny. Allen has already served 10 years of a 65-year sentence for his other assaults, when the DNA match nails him as the predator who attacked Penny. With Allen already in prison, Penny has a tough decision to make. Should she take him to court? We spoke with Penny about how she felt about having to relive this again. And she decided uh, it would be best not to try to prosecute Mr. Allen. As for Stephen Avery, after 18 years in prison for a crime Gregory Allen committed, he's set free. Stunned. I was stunned. I was devastated. I wanted the earth to open and swallow me. That day was more difficult than the day that I was assaulted. Penny just broke down. She was beyond sad, uh, uh, felt that she had been part of something that resulted in a man losing 18 years of his life in prison. I felt uh, sick to my stomach because of the miscarriage of justice. I think it's pretty clear in this case that in the earliest of stages, the Sheriff's Department believed that Mr. Avery committed this assault. They had convinced themselves that it was probably him. Stephen Avery got railroaded. It's easy to see why. Tunnel vision. Once you think you know something, you tend to ignore or dismiss anything that goes against your belief. They had no shadow of a doubt that Avery did it. They were wrong. As terrible as it is that Avery was wrongfully convicted, let's not forget who he was before he went to prison for 18 years. A violent man, and people rarely get better behind bars. Stephen Avery became the poster boy for exoneration, an example of why we need to do a better job of eyewitness identification, why we need to do a better job in our judicial system. How can you possibly apologize to someone adequately for taking away 18 years of their life? I wanted to meet him and apologize in person. We met and we talked about uh, his grandmother had died while he was in prison and he could not attend the funeral. 
His wife had divorced him. His kids had grown up without him. We talked about all of that, and I apologized. And then I said, Steve, can I give you a hug? And he didn't even respond. He just grabbed me in a big bear hug. And I said, so only he could hear, Steve, I am so sorry. And he said, it's OK, Penny. It's over. Steve said to the media, I don't blame the victim. What happened to her was terrible. I blame the police. That a man who served 18 years plus for a crime he didn't commit can say that. I was blown away by his graciousness because I knew that it was just beginning for him. Stephen Avery goes to live and work on his family's 40-acre salvage yard outside Manitowoc. He sues the county for $36 million for his wrongful conviction. But is this the last time Avery will have a run-in with the law? Hello, this is Teresa with Auto Trader Magazine. I'm just giving a call to let you know that I could come out there today. Thank you. It takes 18 years, but in September 2003, Stephen Avery is a free man. With his name cleared in the attack on Penny Burnson, Avery's efforts to get his life back include resuming his old job at his family's salvage business, selling reconditioned vehicles. In 2005, 25-year-old photographer Teresa Hallback is sent to photograph one of Avery's cars. Teresa Hallback was from the heart of Wisconsin. She grew up on a dairy farm. She was as wonderful of a person as you can imagine. Really special. A few days after Teresa's assignment at the Avery Salvage Yard, her mother became concerned because she hadn't contacted her. It was very unusual. So her mother reported her missing. Her name is Teresa. The sheriff's office called Teresa's employers. They haven't heard from her either. Mr. Avery, having uh, at least a prior criminal history of a violent nature, obviously rang a bell. When I first learned that a woman was missing and the last place she was seen was at Stephen Avery's residence, there was an absolute sense of disbelief that this can't possibly be, there has to be some cosmic mistake here. I wish I was surprised, but I'm not. There were reasons the police thought Avery was the one who attacked Penny. He was violent and a sex offender. A massive hunt gets underway for the missing photographer. Two days later, investigators make a chilling discovery. They came across the vehicle of, of Teresa Halbach. When they opened the vehicle, they noticed blood. Preliminary attests returned that the blood was from Teresa Halbach. So we suspected at that very, very early stage that uh, we were dealing with a a very serious crime, most likely a homicide. Avery tells police that Teresa Hallback left the yard when she finished taking pictures. Her vehicle was found here at the cone pen. Really? Blood in it. Really? Investigators scour the salvage yard for more clues. In Stephen Avery's trailer, they find one a 22 caliber rifle. The garage of Stephen Avery is searched and shell casings are found from a 22 caliber rifle. Around the back, more disturbing clues turn up in a burn barrel. Within this burn barrel is electronic calendar, a uh, telephone, and a digital camera belonging to Teresa Halbach. 
In a fire pit, investigators come across a horrific sight. Human remains uh, are found, bones are found, some other uh, very valuable pieces of evidence, including some clothing items belonging to Teresa Hobach. In Avery's trailer, investigators discover another damning clue. A nightstand is moved, and the car key for Teresa's car drops from behind the nightstand. There's been a terrible crime. That seems clear. But are we really going down this path again? There's nothing the cops would like better than to make a case that Avery is as bad as they always said he was. There is a path, all right. Let's follow it. When Teresa's car is found, it's locked in Avery's lot. Inside the car, Teresa's blood. Is there a link between Steve and Avery and Teresa's car? Of course there is. Her car key is in his room. The results of the forensic tests point to a grisly scenario. A forensic anthropologist was able to determine that the bones found in the burn pit were of a female. We found two fragments from the skull. There were holes in the fragments. They were gunshot wounds. There was one tooth that would allow identification. It is the tooth of Teresa Hobach. Teresa's parents' worst fears are confirmed. Their beloved daughter has been murdered. The cops don't yet have enough to indict Avery for homicide, but they do have something else. Mr. Avery had previously been convicted in the state of Wisconsin, and if you are a convicted felon, it is illegal for you to possess a firearm. It's enough to take Avery into custody, despite his claims that he's being set up again. The cops got the wrong man 20 years ago just because they were so convinced that Avery was a bad guy. This time, they have a more powerful motive. Avery's made them look like idiots, and he's about to cost them millions in restitution. Stephen Avery's claim was that the Sheriff's Department were angry over his $36 million wrongful conviction lawsuit and that it made them look bad. This allowed Stephen Avery's lawyers and Stephen Avery to claim that the police were setting them up again, just like last time, that they were uh, planting evidence. When Avery's blood is found in Teresa's car, he says that too is a setup. Stephen Avery claimed that that blood was actually from the vial in the wrongful conviction uh, case 20 years earlier. He claimed that the police got into the clerk of court's office, took some of the blood, and then basically planted it inside Teresa Halbach's vehicle. It's not just the blood that Avery says is a plant. Why are Teresa's car keys only found a week after the original search? The keys were found by deputies after six prior searches of that bedroom. Avery insists Teresa was not murdered at the salvage yard. Parts of the body were planted at two different areas um, on his property, in the burn barrel and in the fire pit. So Avery claimed that the murder occurred somewhere else. It didn't make sense. Steve had filed a civil rights lawsuit. Depositions had begun. The future looked bright but didn't make sense that someone who had the prospect of being compensated monetarily for his lost years would commit a crime. In Avery's garage, investigators uncover the final piece of the forensic puzzle. One piece of physical evidence that was the most crucial in this case a bullet that we know was fired from the gun belonging to Stephen Avery, and on that bullet is the DNA of Teresa Halbach. 
Avery insists that finding this vital piece of evidence in a place that had been thoroughly searched many times shows that it was planted. The defense suggested that the securing of the bullet with Teresa Halbach's DNA on it in the middle of a garage, which is very, very controlled, suggested some vast uh, conspiracy. With the bullet's discovery, Stephen Avery is charged with first-degree murder. Now, it will be up to the jury to decide if he's guilty or being framed. Just over two years after he's released from prison, Stephen Avery is charged with murdering Teresa Hallback. He claims that just like in the Penny Burnson case, the police are setting him up. It's rare for a man with a shady past like Avery's to have the upper hand. The 18 years he spent in prison for a crime he didn't commit will give him an emotional advantage with any jury. Though the cops have a mountain of evidence, they fear the defense will argue there's a grand conspiracy against Avery, motivated by his claim for financial compensation. They need a witness to seal his fate. They find him in Avery's 16-year-old nephew, Brendan Dassey. During a lengthy interview, Brendan Dassey confessed to participating in the murder and the assault of Teresa. Dassey tells detectives he gets back from school one afternoon and hears a woman's voice coming from his Uncle Stephen's trailer. What could you hear? Screaming, like, help me. I knocked on the door and he answered it. He's all sweaty. He went in the trailer? Mm-hmm. And where was Teresa? In his room. She was handcuffed to the bed. What did he say to you? They said that if I wanted to, I can go get some. So he took me back there and showed me her naked body. He told me to do it. And you had intercourse with her? Mm-hmm. Was she saying anything while you were doing this. She told me not to do it, so, and she was crying. After you're done, what happens next? They told me I did a good job, and then watched a little TV. Then what did you talk about? That how he was going to get rid of her body. That he was going to burn her. They tied her up, stabbed her, and jumped on her and started choking her that she couldn't breathe anymore. What do you make you do? Cut her. Cut her where? On her throat. And then what did you do? Then we brought her outside. We set her on the floor, and he shoots her 10 times, and we... We took her out in the back and put her in the fire pit. Absolutely sickening. There is no excusing Stephen Avery's first wrongful conviction, but no matter what happens to you, you are still responsible for the things you do. Dassey's confession seals the case against Avery. When we heard what actually happened, it was so horrendous you could almost not comprehend it. Brendan Dassey later claimed that what he had told the police was not true. He recanted his confession and basically said that the police put the words in his mouth and he just told them what they wanted to hear. But there were certain things in Brendan Dassey's confession that rung true uh, regardless, that no one could have made up what he said unless they were there and knew what happened. Eight months later, Stephen Avery's trial begins. District Attorney Ken Kratz is the lead prosecutor. Horrific details of a terrible crime committed by this defendant. Having the key that fits the vehicle uh, of a murdered individual and his DNA on the key, that convinced me that he was the primary actor in 
having caused the death of Teresa Hobble. The defense claimed that the Manitowoc County Sheriff's planted those keys to tie Stephen Avery to the murder. The keys, after all, uh, were found only after six prior searches by deputies of that bedroom. Then a bullet that we know was fired from the gun belonging to Stephen Avery has Teresa Hobach's DNA on it. After a four-week trial, the jury retire. They need to decide, did Stephen Avery murder Teresa Halbach, or are the police trying to frame him? Their verdict, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. Stephen Avery, who served 18 years in prison for a crime he did not commit, now faces life behind bars without parole for one he did. In a separate trial, his nephew, Brendan Dassey, also gets life. There is no good news in this story. Uh, the Hallbuck family has suffered more than I could ever understand. Uh, Penny has suffered more than I could ever understand. Our children. I'm sure been to a certain extent scarred by this experience. These were crimes that affected uh, and had ripples well beyond our immediate families and into the community. One thing leads to another in life. Stephen Avery would not have been at that place at that time with Teresa Halbach had he not been wrongfully convicted 20 years earlier. I had a hard time reconciling the Stephen Avery that I met with to apologize, who was so gracious with me, with the monster who killed Teresa. Was that rage that enabled him to murder Teresa really rage that he felt towards me as his female accuser? The case of Stephen Avery is a classic. Avery spent 18 years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. And who's to say those years didn't rob him of the chance he had to become a decent guy? The legal system is not perfect, but we get much more right than we get wrong. This time, Avery was justly convicted, and he will spend the rest of his days in prison, which is exactly where he belongs. <laughs>